Grace, I believe that we've just gone live, and I'm lucky to have my producer next to me, Sovereign. Um, so if there's any mistakes, it's definitely not attributed to me. You can all throw rocks at Sovereign. I'd like to welcome you again, wherever you are in the world. This is uh, 10 o'clock p.m. in Bali, Indonesia, and I'm delighted to be with my beloved friends, Elena and Alejandro. Uh, you don't, I don't need any introduction, but please say hi to the audience. Yes, hi everyone, We're, and hi Sasha, what an honor for us to do this exciting show with you today and dive into our history. Yes. Super, super exciting, and uh, we chose, because we're doing a whole sequence of, of shows, everyone is sort of smitten with uh, your Scala um, divination technology and your approach and, uh, and the way it helps to triangulate soul frequencies and reading archetypes and um, understanding character and nature of, of, of people. Um, I've got to tell you, it's the, it's the single biggest talked about thing uh, in our new earth uh, ecosystem. Uh, speaking to so many people uh, around the world and getting so many messages and feedback. Uh, at the university as well, I spoke to the New Earth um, Council uh, in uh, this this last week, and everyone was thrilled. Like, we, everyone wants their numbers, so you know, expect that you guys are going to get bombarded. Everyone wants to know what the postman soul frequency is, what their mistress's soul frequency is. <laughs> I, I think it's the most amazing navigation tool, and the more I think about it, uh, the more excited I get. Uh, Alejandro, maybe you could give a little bit of background on the tech technology side and give some context to people looking in um, who, who haven't um, experienced this and haven't seen any of the previous uh, shows we've done. Well, the technology is, uh, you know, as, as you said, uh, uh, scalar waves and, and we read frequencies and that's how we're able to capture the information that is imprinted in the uh, electromagnetic field and uh, on the field of information, right? Um, they were constantly feeding it uh, individually and collectively as well, and it's feeding that information back to us and, uh, and plays, of course, a crucial role in the human experience. Now, we use uh, three instruments simultaneously, and it's a uh, double-blind um, uh, process and, and the way that we, it takes two people to do it. And uh, I don't know exactly uh, where she's doing uh, or where she's at. And she doesn't know where I'm at. And then when we actually synchronized is when we know that we have uh, 100% accuracy. And that is the, the right information, uh, you know, the, the answer of the question that we are, uh, that we're asking. Okay, so, so truth pill here. Um, how, how often do you get it wrong? I will say that we measured uh, the level of accuracy is uh, uh, at least 99%. Whoa. Okay. Those are very worthy odds. I, I'm a bookmaker now. This is good. Yes. <laughs> really good. And how disappointed are you when the numbers don't align? And what, what, are the, what, are the, what are the variables? What do you read into that? If you don't align on numbers, what can, that, what can be the circumstances around that? It's, if I may, it's a great yes. question because actually when we read, we immediately disconnect from attaching to any of the stories. And that's the key is never to mm -hmm. attach to any of the narratives that we've been shown, given. Um, and when we read information, we just accept it as is because numbers tell a very powerful story and it's beyond what our human experience is trying to attach to it. So it's disconnecting from human stories and diving into the very core, the very essence, the very soul of what. So, so, so interesting what you just said because what you've said is it's removing it's it's removing interpretation, and mm -hmm. which is amazing because if it's removing interpretation, um, you're really getting the, the isness. It's that which is that which self exists, self reflects, self reveals in the field. That's what that's what uh, comes to the fore, yeah. And that's what you triangulate with these vectors. And just remind me again, how many vectors can you ultimately apply if you're looking at a human being using this remote um, uh, scalar technology? How many vectors can you apply to build up a holographic image of the soul frequency of that individual? 
at the moment uh, we have over 140,000, but we can really uh, is is open to unlimited possibilities and and one's imagination, right? That's the ones you figure out how this really works and how uh, accurate it is. Then you can really expand and and uh, and increase those numbers. You know? Well, okay, and, and I'm just being told by someone here that my audio is highly modulated, poor quality. Guys, all I can do is apologize. We're in the jungle of Southeast Asia here um, in the monsoon season, so I'm sorry. Really, best I can do, um, but but keep keep speaking. I'm watching. I'm watching these comments come through. Um, well, let's let's move let's move on to the subject at hand. Last show we did, we looked at um, all of the kind of dark. Um, apparatus of the deep state, um, the CIA, banking, you know, c- central banks, Federal Reserve, um, the Anthony Fauci's, the little CDC's, all of that stuff. And, and we really got a commonality there, um, which was pretty low, pretty diabolical, destructive frequencies. So again, for people who are not too familiar and need to have some background, um, you've got two audits that you put forth. One is from a scale of one to a thousand, which applies to certain vectors. And then there's another one where you actually just do percentages, like one to a hundred percent. Can you just explain, take two examples of the one to thousand and two examples of the percentile and explain how that works and why it works? Yes, thank you. So the reason we apply two different measurement techniques is... um, Zero to a thousand is a consciousness scale that was beautifully created and given to humanity by Dr. David Hawkins. For those of you that are familiar with his work or not, uh, Power Versus Force is a great uh, reference book to refer to. And zero to a thousand, uh, he assigns different emotions that are linked to different frequencies and therefore states of consciousness, a lens through which we perceive our reality. So anything below 200 has to do with the illusion of separation from your inner self and the collective. And this is what I call the hijacking of the matrix where that tends to happen. And there's many other frequencies, of course, 500 being love, 400 being reason, 600 is a peace frequency, 700 to 1,000 is the state of enlightenment, okay? So this is to us a a uh, qualifying things, okay? Now, we look at percentages because, and that's not Dr. David Hawkins' work, by the way, and we do not use kinesiology for those of you that are curious, right? We just incorporated the scale. Percentages have to do with quantifying things, zero to 100, because you can experience your ego, being in the ego, and have all different emotions. So it's not linked to the quantity of how much time you're spending in the now, quantity of how much you're enjoying your process or the role you're playing, because you can enjoy your role and do either great things or evil things in life. Mm -hmm. So this is why we we're looking at all these different aspects. And as you say, vectors that gives us an insight into what makes up that human. being. Are you suggesting that Bill Gates might actually enjoy culling humanity? Is that what you're suggesting? Yes. 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 So looking at thousands of people, we recognize that those that are playing in the shadow roles, Mm -hmm are actually enjoying their role to the fullest. Yes. yes. And that's really when you can tell that the person is playing, uh, but no doubt, without a doubt, an evil role, because you have someone that is vibrating at an extremely low uh, vibration of frequency, but it is uh, enjoying the role that they're playing at 100%, right? And, Fascinating. Fascinating. As somebody's just written in, and uh, I'm afraid it's an unpronounceable name. I'm not even going to try it. Uh, the, the third name is Harp, or A A O E L I A N Harp, uh, and pointing out to us. And you guys, I don't think, know this. Today, according to the Julian calendar, is the 31st of October, which means today is Halloween. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that? That's weird, isn't it? Mm-hmm. There we go. Okay. Interesting fact. So we chose to do witches and warlocks on the Julian Halloween. I'm going to take your word for it, Harp, and I don't want any rocks at the head from anyone out there that says otherwise. Um, let's crack on. We've got um, a bunch of witches and warlocks throughout history. 
Uh, you guys have done a lot of intensive work this week. Um, Joan of Arc, everyone knows Joan of Arc, <clears throat> 1412 um, until 1431. So she died in the 15th century, was burned at the stake. She was nicknamed the Maid of uh, Orleans, is considered a heroine of France for her role during the Lancastrian phase of the Hundred Years' War. And of course, she was canonized as a Catholic saint. Um, she claimed to receive visions of the Archangel Michael, St. Margaret, and St. Catherine of Alexandria, uh, instructing her to support Charles VII and recover France from English domination um, late in the Hundred Years' War. So she was a big political activist. Okay, uh, thank God they don't burn us political activists today at the stake. Well, not, not yet. I'm sure they, I'm sure Biden and Kamala are planning that. Uh, she gained prominence after the siege was lifted only nine days later. <clears throat> blah, blah, blah. Let's get to where she in. <clears throat> she was burned at the stake on 30th of May, 1431, dying at about 19 years of age. Um, and she was put on trial essentially <clears throat> by the pro English bishop, uh, Pierre. Couchon, maybe Pierre Couchon is almost French for pig, isn't it? Uh, that may also make sense. So let's talk about her. In 1456, the notes also tell me an, an inquisitorial court authorized Pope um, Alexis uh, III examined the trial and debunked the charges against her, pronounced her innocent, and declared her a martyr. So subsequent to that time, she's always been seen as a tremendous martyr. Uh, but what were the soul frequency readings of Joan of Arc? Yes, thank you, Sasha, for this introduction. I want to say one thing. For us, it's always an honor to dive into history and in some cases, either rewrite history hmm. by revealing the truth of what we discover. And I would say set some souls free. So that's, in most cases, it's really the case in some of the revelations that we will be uh, revealing today. And again, just to put it in perspective, our divine field of information has everything in it. Past, present, and future all exist in the now. So for those of you that are curious, information can easily be retrieved from the past because it's it's history that's stored in the divine field. So Joan of Arc, she incarnated at the frequency of 250, which is a frequency of neutrality. She was born at the frequency of fear 100. And at the moment, um, at her peak of her life, she was at the frequency of 400, which is reason and high intellect. Of course, we looked at all these different parameters related to Joan of Arc, her health, she viewed through the lens of reason, 400. Creativity, 650. So she was extremely creative. This is the frequency of peace. Finances were at a frequency of 200, which is the frequency of courage relationships she viewed through the lens of peace, also 625, even though the, she was this revolutionary soul. Personal growth for Joan of Arc was 950. So she had this enlightened relationship and full commitment to her personal growth, which is why I would say she also received messages and we'll dive into her intuition next. Her intuition was at the frequency of 750. So she had an enlightened relationship with intuition. So therefore, it confirms the history that, yes, she most likely did receive messages from Archangel Michael and some other beings uh, that led her into, and her conviction with her personal growth, right, led her into the martyr status where she's seen. Philanthropy is also 700. So she viewed philanthropy through the lens of enlightenment. So therefore, I would say that she was here to serve humanity based on that. She experienced joy, how much she enjoyed her role. 94% of the time, she was fully present in her beingness at 94%. Ego ruled her life, 83%. Ego, Ego 83%. She was 100% in her integrity. So that means she was absolutely loyal to her cause, to her beliefs, and she honored every part of herself. Self-awareness, she was 97% self-aware, 100% clear what her mission was, and therefore she was 100% aligned with her divine and her personal purpose. So 
Beautiful. Wow. Confirms. A hundred, a hundred and a hundred, those last three numbers. Yes. Yes. Wow, that is remarkable. And integrity, a hundred. Yes. Money side, seven percent awareness. Ego, 83%. Good than mine. I like that. In the now, 94%. In the joy, 94%. That last 6%, presumably, was when she was at the stake. Philanthropy, 700. Um, intuition, 700. I missed personal growth. Can you just repeat that? Yes, personal growth, 950. 950. She was wow. had an enlightened relationship with uh, personal growth. That was really her, right? Her Amazing. mission and intuition, 750. So she was absolutely receiving guidance. She was a channel, a conduit of information that was coming through for her. So as far as you're concerned, the, 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 the archetype of Joan of Arc is pretty absolute. I mean, she really lived up um, all of these centuries later. Uh, she really lives up to the legend. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would say it's so beautiful because she's transcended her 100 frequency at birth, which is fear. She yeah. overcame fear to rise and serve humanity in a very beautiful way. So no wonder that she's a heroine in, and seen, right, as a legend in, in so many cultures and, of course, in France. And she's seen as a saint, right? She was canonized. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's very, very rare, very rare for someone to transcend the, the level of, uh, of fear. You know, it takes a lot of work and a lot of commitment to personal growth, especially. Yes. And really, yes. Okay, tremendous. I'm having a real hard time making all these notes. Next time, I'm going to ask you to send me through. Uh, <laughs> so I have to write them all down so I can do comparisons as well. Okay, let's let's move on <clears throat> to the second one, who's going to be um, arguably the most popular, um, Nostradamus. Now, depending on the source, um, he was born either the 14th or the 21st of December 1503. So not too far apart um, from Joan of Arc and died in 1566, so at about the age of 63. Um, his name was uh, Michel de Nostradamus, but he's known as Nostradamus. He was an astrologer, physician, and a reputed seer who's best known for his book. Um, it's French, I'm not going to try. A collection of 942 poetic quatrains. That's what he's famous for allegedly predicting future events. I don't think there's much allegedly about it by now. The book was first published in 1555. His family was originally Jewish, alert the press, but had converted to Catholic Christianity before he was born. Um, studied in Avignon, was forced to leave um, after just over a year when the university closed due to an outbreak of the plague. And he worked in an apothecary, entered the University of Montpellier, uh, hoping to earn a doctorate, but was, it was almost immediately expelled after his work as an apothecary, which was manual trade uh, that was forbidden by the uh, by the university statutes. He was just, uh, he first married in 1531, but his wife and two children died. Uh, that was probably his great agony. One imagines and a defining one imagines that that event would have been a defining signature. Um, they died in 1534 during another plague outbreak. He fought alongside doctors against the plague before uh, remarrying. He had six children with, with Anne Ponsard. He then wrote the Almanac in 1550 and as a result of its success continued writing them for future years and began then working as an astrologer for various wealthy uh, patrons. Catherine de Medici of course famously uh, amongst his supporters. Um, I'm not going to continue reading all of the He suffered from gout uh, which eventually developed into edema. I've never even heard of that. He died on 2nd of July, 1566. Um, and many uh, authors have subsequently retold stories about Nostradamus. There's hardly uh, a man or woman alive who hasn't heard of him. Um, it points out that his predictions are characteristically vague, meaning they could they could be applied to different different interpretations. Uh, and, a, and a useless for determining whether their author had any real prophetic powers. Well, that's what the academics argue. Uh, but they point out that English translations of his quatrains are all, all, almost always extremely poor quality. 
um, which might have something to do with it. I personally think that the what I know of him and his quatrains, having read a few of them and deciphered a few, mm-hmm. um, that the, I always figured he was a good guy. But I guess you you're about to tell us. So give us <laughs> give us notes on the famous Nostradamus. Yes, his overall vibration of frequency is at 600, which is the level of peace. Um, he incarnated at 600 as well. And um, he was born with a frequency of 500, which is the level of love. Obviously, he was uh, somewhat impacted by um, the environment of whatever his mother was experiencing at the time when he was in utero, right? Yeah. Uh, when it came to health, his relationship with health was at 600, which he had a peaceful relationship with health, right? Finances, 540. <clears throat> Excuse me, 540. Creativity, 850. Enlightened. Wow. Enlightened, definitely. Uh, very creative, uh, uh, no doubt, based on, on what we know of him. Relationships, 725. Enlightened relationship. Yes. Lens, yeah. Personal growth, 850. Philanthropy, 710. Intuition, 950. So there's no doubt that he was uh, uh, channeling uh, divine information, you know, uh, and from from uh, high vibrational uh, frequency beings, of course. Yes. Uh, yeah. His channel of communication with the divine source was clear, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, he enjoyed uh, his uh, divine role at uh, 96% of the time. Just a little bit higher than Joan of Arc, 2%. Yes. Higher. Three percent higher, yes. Mm-hmm. He was in the present moment, also ninety-eight percent, the same uh, as. Uh, oh, actually, Joan of Arc was ninety-four. I'm sorry, you had another date. Yeah. So ninety-eight percent for uh, Michel. Okay. In the ego, it was thirty-six percent. So his ego was very low. Uh, one of the lowest we have read so far. We've read few within that range, but there are very, very few people at that level. Integrity was 98%. 98, okay. 98. Self-awareness, 100%. Clarity, 100%. And he was 100% in alignment with his divine and his personal purpose. Wow, just like, uh, same as Joan of Arc. Exactly, yes. Okay, for those who are just coming on, because we're now up to nine, just over 900 viewers, um, I will just tell you, we're just reading the soul frequency uh, and various critical vectors um, on Nostradamus. Um, and we just did Joan of Arc moments ago. Um, but those numbers are pretty radically, I would say, radically enlightened pretty much throughout. Mm, yes. Fair comment? Yes, absolutely. Well, yeah. we'll say that it um, every every number that we get for, for each aspect of one's life, um, it, it is related to the level of resistance, right? So at this level, uh, he had hardly any resistance uh, at all, right? So he's, uh, especially when it comes to intuition, a 950, and the rest of the numbers are just uh, amazing, really. Is in line to what we know about it, uh, yeah. about him. No? So, so the lowest, the lowest signature that we're seeing in Nostradamus, that I'm seeing, wow, is um, wow. five forty in finances. Yeah, five forty in finances. There you go. So he was a little bit kind of eh, about money, right? It wasn't. Uh, how, how do you interpret five hundred and forty? On a scale of one to a thousand, as it relates to finance, if somebody has a 540 signature, what does that mean? They, they just they have uh, a relationship beyond love, uh, relationship with money, of or anything related to finances. You know, joy is is one level up after the love level, 
and they just uh, anything related to finances, they just feel joy. Uh, so joy. So he, had healthy, he had a healthy relationship with it. Yes, definitely. He yeah. had captured the Medici as a patron. I mean, you can't get better than that, you know. So he was doing okay. Right. But, yes. <laughs> that's the point. He that's was not only only comfortable, but he was enjoying it to the fullest. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Next, you carry on. Carry on. About him, I want to say, which is unlike many you know, people that we read, people who channel, especially for him, he was channeling, but he didn't apply his ego into it. You see, mm -hmm. his ego was at 36%. Yes. He put his ego aside and allowed for the divine information to flow in the way it was meant to flow. And that's the beautiful part is, is he didn't, his ego didn't interfere much. Right, right. Very good. Let's mm -hmm. move on to uh, Vangelia Pandeva. Gusterova, born <laughs> Ukrova, Bulgarian. Okay. Um, born, third, thank you for sending me notes in Bulgarian and Russian. Um, 3rd of October 1911, died in 11, 1996. Commonly known as Baba Vanga. That's what she was uh, world renowned for. Um, or Grandma Vanga. She was a Macedonian Bulgarian mystic and clairvoyant and herbalist. Uh, born or blind since early childhood, uh, she spent most of her life in the in the uh, mountains in Bulgaria, um, and claimed claimed. Oh, sorry, Jenny Kostadinova claimed in 1997 that millions of people believed that she uh, possessed paranormal abilities. Um, okay, let me see. If there's anything else interesting I can pick up on? Um, her father was an internal. Macedonian revolutionary organization activist and scripted into the Bulgarian army. Um, blah, blah, blah. In 1925, she was brought to a school for the blind in the city of Zeman in the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, where she spent three years and was taught to read Braille there. After the death of her stepmother, she had to go back home to take care of her younger siblings. Her family was very poor, she had to work. All day in 1939, she contracted pleurisy. Although it remained largely inactive for some years, the doctor's opinion was that she would soon die, but she recovered. Um, during World War II, Yugoslavia, of course, was invaded and dismembered by the Axis powers. At that time, Banga attracted believers in her ability to heal and to prophesy, to soothsay. The number of people visiting her, hoping to get a hint about whether their family members were still alive during the war, uh, seeking for the place where they died, and she was answering those questions in her divinations. Uh, and on the 8th of April 1942, the Bulgarian star, um, the, the big man himself, Boris III, visited her. 10th of May 1942, she married an, a Bulgarian soldier um, who had come asking for the killers of his brother, but had to promise her not to seek revenge. And shortly before marriage, uh, Dimitar and Vanga moved to Petrish, where she became well known. He was conscripted to the Bulgarian army, um, blah, blah, blah. He got another illness, fell into alcoholism, and eventually died. He continued to be visited by dignitaries and commoners after the Second World War. Um, she became famous because Bulgarian politicians and leaders from different Soviet republics including uh, Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev, uh, sought her soothsaying, her counsel. And that was in the 1990s. And a church was built in Bogdan uh, with money left by her visitors. She died in 1996 from breast cancer. Her funeral attracted huge crowds, including dignitaries. And fulfilling Vanga's last will and testament, her Petrish house was turned into a museum, which opened its doors in 2000. Eight. Tell us about the soul frequency of the most beloved Baba Vanga. Yes, thank you. And I just want to say for us, it's always an honor to dive into these characters, into these people, bring them to life, mm. and really honor every soul that we read. This is our intent, of course, is to honor, honor everyone, because everyone has their unique, beautiful journey in life. Yes. So Baba Vanga uh, was a very special person. The one thing that I wanted to say, um, perhaps you, you didn't realize, is she was not blind when she was born, but she had an accident and she was supposedly taken up by a tornado and thrown into the field. 
And as a result of it, um, she had massive damage to her eyes and uh, she became blind later on, in, you know, later on in life, but she was still quite young. So her frequency overall was a frequency of peace, 600. Very beautiful. She incarnated at the frequency of 600 and was born at the frequency of 600. And it's quite interesting because looking into her birth, I was very curious historically what happened is she actually was born premature and had a lot of uh, illness and she was not given her name for a while until they were sure, her family was sure that she could survive. But it's amazing that her soul decided to remain at the frequency of 600, which is peace. She brought so much peace and it, yeah. it's been transparent throughout her life. Health, she viewed through the lens of peace, 600. Wow. Creativity, 850. She had an enlightened relationship with her inspiration and action, her creativity. The same, Finally, as, Nostradamus, same as Nostradamus. Same as Nostradamus. Yeah. Yes. Finances, she had a peaceful relationship with finances, 600. Relationships, she viewed through the lens of 850, which is the lens of enlightenment. She had this enlightened way of being with others and relating to others. This is a very unusual part. Personal growth for her was at the frequency of 1000. And we've checked it a couple of times. And this is fully embodied being. She was so committed to personal growth she literally channeled it and it came through her work in a beautiful way so i would say there she was a fully integrated being yes philanthropy she viewed through the lens of 850 which is again a lens of enlightenment she was absolutely generous giving and serving humanity in a beautiful way intuition for baba vanga was 810 which is a level of enlightenment so of course she channeled uh, divine information in the most magnificent way for humanity. Joy, she experienced joy 93% of the time. And of course, she was at this peace frequency. So that's mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. She was 98% in the now. That means she was so present with her presence. Yeah. She was 37% in her ego. So again, this is a human being who served beautifully and her ego did not rule her life. Similar to Nostradamus yes, as well. Yes, very yep. similar. Integrity at 100%. She was full of integrity. She was 100% self-aware, 100% clear of what really she was here to do. And she was 100% aligned with her divine and personal purpose. Wow, okay, very good. No wonder she left such a powerful mark right in, in in this world with her beingness because she was everything well, that people read yes so, so what's remarkable is that she shares so much identical signature to nostradamus so that's yes. Bonga, the bulgarian grandmother mystic um very very similar to nostradamus fascinating and again the lowest reading on her soul frequency would come to the um so oh, yeah. ego, which is a very good low reading. Yes. And the other low reading would be what? Six hundreds, which is peace. So this is a person who didn't have a lot of resistance in her life. She really lived her life, I would say, in the flow with the divine. Now she lived, she was born in 1911, died in 96. So she lived, what, 85 years. Okay, good innings. All right. Thank you. That that was fascinating. Yes. Um, I probably, uh, no, did you want to comment anything else on Baba Vanga? No, I just what you know. For us, when we were reading her, it was an honor because she was truly a beautiful human being. Truly. And you know, I'm so glad I heard this because uh, anyone coming from Bulgaria, you know, gypsies, you know, it, 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 there's a mystical there's a mystical tradition out there which is kind of a gin quality. Um, and it's, for me, it's really good to get that uh, that perspective on Vanga. I kind of thought she was a bit darker, to be honest with you. My sense was that she might have been a bit more of a, a crystal-gazing um, gypsy. But this is just like enlightened pretty much throughout. Very interesting. Um, John D. This is, for me, one of my favorite characters. Not as a good guy, but as an interesting historical archetype. 
Um, so again, for those who don't know, 15, uh, born in 1527, uh, died in 1609, and he was an Anglo-Welsh mathematician and the astronomer, astrologer, um, royal, really, because he, was, uh, he worked very closely in Elizabeth I's reign. He was an occultist and an alchemist. He was a court astronomer and advisor to Elizabeth I and spent much of his time on alchemy and divination and hermetic philosophy. As an antiquarian, he had one of the largest libraries in England at the time. As a political advisor, he advocated for the founding of English colonies in the New World to form a British Empire. Wow. So that, that's, that's an interesting piece, a, a term that is actually credited with coining. Uh, in my lectures moving forward, I will remember that. I didn't know that. No, that John Dee and the Queen Elizabeth I, uh, which was her favorite alchemist, astrologer, um, crystal gazer, that he was the man who coined the uh, British Empire. He eventually left Elizabeth's service and went on a quest for a deeper realm of the occult and supernatural, aligning himself with several individuals who may have been charlatans. He traveled throughout Europe and was accused of spying for the English crown. Upon his return to England, he found home and library had been vandalized. He eventually returned to the service of the Queen, but was turned away when So let's go into the frequencies of John D. Um, I guess we're live and Sasha will be back in a moment. So we'll wait until she he comes back. Huh? He's back. Sorry, guys. He's back. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, yes. I apologize. So I was just uh, signing off by saying um, that he was removed um, from off my <laughs> first, uh, when Queen Elizabeth I died. And he died in poverty in London and his grave site is unknown so an ignominious end uh, to a pretty spectacular mm -hmm. character I, I he was also connected i understand to sir francis walsingham who is the spy master general so you talk about british empire and and walsingham and the spy master general was the progenitor of the cia and the you know mossad and mi5 and mi6 and all that creepy deep state intelligence apparatus mm. uh, surveillance and all that evil witchery issues from the time of John D and um, and Sir Francis Walsingham under the reign of Elizabeth the first. So tell us what the soul frequencies are of John D. John D vibrational frequency uh, was five hundred, or is, <laughs> so which is the level of love, right? Um, he incarnated at three seventy five which is the level of uh, acceptance. He was born at the frequency of 250, which is the level of uh, neutrality, you know, live and let live, you know, one usually is pretty comfortable, a comfortable uh, level. Uh, health, his relationship with health was at 500. Creativity was at 750. Finances, 200, which is the level of courage. Relationships, 400. Well, wow. level of reason, or high intellect. Oh, well, one tends to really uh, analyze very carefully before establishing any relationships. Uh, personal growth, 950. So he was committed to personal growth. Philanthropy, 540. Uh, brought him joy, actually, to be involved in any activity related to philanthropy, rather sharing his time or, or money. No? Right. Uh, yeah. Intuition, he was at 750. So he was definitely very intuitive and also in, uh, was able to channel information from the divine field of information. Uh, in the joy, he enjoyed yeah. uh, his divine role 87% of the time. He was 
In the present moment or in the now, 92%. Okay. In the ego was 78%. So it, I mean, it's a good number, of course. Uh, this, I will say that in high, above 90 is when, when the ego uh, is, starts to dictate what the next step is and, and to, you know, in, uh, contribute to the thinking process. Um, integrity is at 90%. Wow. Wow, that's curious. Very. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, Self-awareness, 98%. Okay. For those looking in, we're talking about John D., uh, who, who was the great um, um, oracle in the time of Queen Elizabeth I. And Elena and Alejandro have done the soul frequencies, um, signatures of John D., uh, we've run through a few others, uh, but carry on. So you've just said his integrity was 90, his awareness was 98%. Clarity, 100%. Okay. Divine purpose and personal purpose was at 100%. So he was no really aligned with his divine and his personal purpose. Okay, so what is fascinating already today, even if we wrapped up the show here, what is fascinating <laughs> is doing famous historical witches and warlocks, what we're seeing is that they're all so far, and that's Joan of Arc, Nostradamus, uh, 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 Baba Vanga, and John D. Um, they're all at 100% alignment with personal um, uh, incarnation purpose and with their divine purpose. They're also 100%, uh, literally 100% in alignment. Their clarity is all 100%. <clears throat> And their awareness is all between 97 and 100 percent. Their integrity is all between 90 and 100 percent. Um, just incredible figures. Personal growth is also a high one. The lowest threshold was Nostradamus, 850, Joan of Arc, 950, Vanga, 1000 percent, and John D, 950 percent. The lowest um, reading of him is really 200 when it comes to money, as you said, courage. Yes. So that, that means that he wasn't born with money. He had to kind of brave his way through life, um, getting coin wherever he could from patron, uh, patrons or, or what have you, but courageous nonetheless. Yes. Um, and you say that he was born at 250 out of a scale of one to a thousand, which is the, which is what, uh, courage did you say? 250 is neutrality. Neutrality. Yes. What, means what? The soul is saying, meh. <laughs> <I can't. laughs> what does that mean? Neutrality. Well, you go from a, acceptance at, you know, is uh, at 350, but he was actually, he incarnated at 375. So he went from, okay, you know, I, I understand what's about to happen here. <laughs> and he was impacted by outside circumstances and dropped to, a neutrality to where, oh, okay, wait a minute. Now, okay, I'm comfortable here. Let's see what happens. Anyway. <laughs> okay. So his life ultimately was a successful one because he incarnated to do what he did and to be what he was. That's it. What, yes, that's what we see yes. from this. Yes, yes. He transcended what? as well, which is uh, uh, due to his commitment to personal growth, especially. Right. Yes. Fascinating. So Alistair Crowley is our next one. And of course, world famous. Alistair Crowley, born Edward Alexander Crowley in 1875, died in 1947. So he was 450, 60, 73, thereabouts when he died. He was an occultist, a ceremonial magician, a poet, a painter, a novelist, and a mountaineer. Uh, founded the religion of Thelema, identified himself as a prophet entrusted with guiding humanity. He had a messianic complex. Um, he entered the Aeon of Horus, guiding humanity into the Aeon, uh, the Age of Horus in the early 20th century. He was a prolific writer, published widely over the course of his life. He was born to a wealthy family. He rejected his, his uh, religious uh, faith that he was born to and pursued Western esotericism. He was educated at Cambridge University. He focused on mountaineering and poetry. Um, Biographers alleged that here it was that he was recruited into the British intelligence agency, um, suggesting that he remained a spy throughout his life. In 1898, he joined the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, where he was trained in ceremonial magic by 
uh, Mathers and Alan Bennett moving to a uh, Loch Ness in Scotland. He went mountaineering in Mexico with uh, that's boring. No one wants to know about that. He studied Hindu and Buddhism, Hinduism and Buddhism in India and married Rose Kelly in 1904. Uh, they traveled to Egypt. That was where he claimed to have been contacted by a supernatural entity named Iwas, who provided him with the book of the law a sacred text that served as the basis for his religious um, uh, doctrine, Thelema, announcing the start of the, the age of Horus. Uh, the, so that was where he got his Egyptian uh, root. The book declared that its followers should do what thou wilt. This is where the, the, the myth of, of Crowley as a purebred Luciferic Satanist issues out of. The do what thou wilt is antithetical to thy will be done, of course, you know. So most idolatrous um, uh, pedestrian Christians who are more caught up in the idolatry of Christianity than understanding the mystical, mystical traditions, they misinterpret that thy will be done. They, they, they forget that thy will be done must align fully with my will be done as an actualized human being. And that's the point of us being born to this world, not to become slaves of some goddamn angry, jealous God of old who wants that bullshit. So it's beautiful <laughs> when you see that Crowley actually represented some archetypal shift. He came in to really stir up the, stir up the soup after an unsuccessful, so, so the, the do what thou wilt, Monica, that's been attributed to him uh, was him seeking uh, people to uh, getting people to seek to align themselves with their true will through the practice of magic. And that, of course, is where it becomes a little bit dodgy. After an unsuccessful, no, I'm going to move forward. He gained widespread notoriety during his lifetime, being a recreational drug taker, a bisexual and an individualist social critic. Wow, he'd be a perfect Democrat today in the United States. Crowley, it's, a joke. it's a joke. Crowley has remained a highly influential figure over Western esotericism and counterculture and continues to be considered a prophet uh, by, by those who subscribe to his uh, doctrine. He's the subject of various biographies and academic studies. Tell us about the shocking Alistair Crowley. What do you know about his soul signature? Yes, fascinating person. Okay, he incarnated at the frequency of 250, which is neutrality. His overall frequency during his life was 250. And at birth, he was born at the frequency of fear, 100. Health, he viewed through the lens of grief, 75. Finances, frequency of 200, which is courage. Creativity was 250, neutrality. Relationships, he viewed through the lens of fear, 100. So there was definitely a disconnect in how he related to others. Personal growth, he viewed through the lens of reason, 450. So he was committed to personal growth, but it was never a love, a love relationship for him. It was always very intellectual. Philanthropy, he viewed through the lens of 250, which is the lens of neutrality. And intuition was also neutrality, 250. He experienced joy. That means how much he enjoyed playing his role was 62%. In the now, he was 67% of the time. His ego was at 93%. So his ego... <laughs> I, would, I would have put a bet on that. Okay, 93%. Yeah, ego, ego definitely ruled his decision-making. So again, sorry, so people looking in, we're talking now about Alistair Crowley and his soul frequencies that have had the scalar divinations done by Elena and Alejandro. Um, so carry on. We're at integrity now. On integrity, Crowley. yeah, eighty-four percent integrity. So he definitely yeah. sacrificed. Uh, I would say integrity uh, below ninety. There's definitely sacrificing that's going on. Self-awareness is at ninety-two percent. So he was aware of himself. He had ninety-one percent clarity, and his divine and personal purpose were both at ninety-one percent. Wow. That's so interesting. So we've moved from four archetypal good people. Oh, well, hang about. John D was kind of middling. But he's 91, 91, 91. So we've now dropped from 100, 100, 100 um, of personal and divine incarnation alignment and clarity, which we had with Joan of Arc, Nostradamus, Baba Vanga, and John D. 
So these are the lowest readings so far. The lowest of all being essentially 100 uh, on relationship, on the scale of 100 to 1,000. So again, can you describe Alistair Crowley's signature for relationships throughout his life was 100, yeah. um, 1,000. What does that mean? So 100 is a frequency of fear. So it's interesting because he was born at the fear frequency. So I would say that that impacted his decision making and how he was relating to others throughout his life. It translated very clearly in his relationship area. So it was, it's definitely someone who doesn't trust other people who views relationships or other people as not safe, right? So he didn't view relationships as safe. Okay, but, but looking at these signatures of him, um, 250 incarnation, born at 100, which is, 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 that's a troubling signature to be born at, right? Yes and no, because we all have a free will to choose to shift out of it. So every one of us chooses a certain frequency to experience. And in his case, he shifted out of that frequency, but it still ruled a lot of aspects in his life. So if okay. it's still predominant in certain aspects, that could be troubling, right? If you're not working through it. But for somebody who is uh, creating new religion and uh, prophesizing, that could be troubling. Okay, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think that was my point. So interesting. Uh, we've gone here from John D to Crowley, Alistair Crowley, and we're getting into the kind of slightly turgid um, numbers. The, the highest number that you could uh, commend him for um, would be um, awareness at 92% uh, relate, uh, and and that's really the 93% ego is not a good thing but 92% awareness is probably the highest chalk up he gets right yes I mean he has personal growth at 450 so it shows that he was definitely interested in personal growth Right. He approached it from a mind versus the heart and enlightened perspective. So he was a very analytical person and he viewed personal growth. Therefore, whatever he, religion he created from a very analytical perspective versus heart centered. Right. But, but are these the numbers of a diabolical human being? I wouldn't call it diabolical. I mean, we've, we're going to read somebody else who's definitely in a much lower frequency today. Okay, so then we'll, we'll revisit him when we get there. So let's move on. Yeah. Thank you, Elena and Alejandro mm -hmm. for that. Um, yeah. Let's move on to Agnes Waterhouse. Now, for those of you who don't know, really interesting, really interesting character. Born in 1503, uh, died in 1566. So she was 63 years of, old when she, uh, years of age when she died, also known as Mother Waterhouse. And she was the first woman to be executed as a witch in England. In 1566, she was accused of witchcraft at the age of 63, uh, along with two other women, Elizabeth Francis and Joan Waterhouse. All three women were from the same, excuse me, village. Um, she confessed to having been a witch and that her fam familiar was a cat, uh, which was later turned into a toad. So that was the story. Uh, and that the, the, the toad was called Satan, sometimes spelt Satan with an H, which originally belonged to Elizabeth Francis. So Agnes was put on trial in Chelmsford, Essex, England in 1566 for using witchcraft to cause illness to William Finn, who died in 1565, the year before. She was also charged with using sorcery to kill livestock, cause illness, and bring about the death of her husband. Her 18-year-old daughter, Joan Waterhouse, was also accused but found not guilty of the same crime. Joan Waterhouse's testimony ultimately helped to convict the two other women. Agnes was hanged and uh, the first woman executed for witchcraft uh, and was the first woman executed for witchcraft in England. So uh, please, soul frequencies on Agnes Waterhouse, the 16th century first woman to be executed for witchcraft in England. Hmm. Her vibration of frequency is 125, which is the level of uh, desired, you know, the, this desired uh, really, uh, it could be uh, for power, control, and uh, also it could be um, addiction, you know, someone yeah. could be addicted to power, control, and so forth, right? Or, or not necessarily drugs and alcohol. 
Okay. Uh, no idea why that's happening. Yes, there is an alarm system they're testing. Uh oh. I'm muting you guys to spare the audience that ghastly noise. You've been muted. Tell me, put your hand up when that sound stops, and then I'll unmute you and let you out of prison. Or we can continue the rest of the session uh, using a semaphore. Um, just so you know, we've got just shy of a thousand uh, people, about 965, 970 people looking, looking in. Um, are you? Let me unmute you. Now. Um, yeah. Still going. <laughs> um, do, okay. How do you want to navigate this? <laughs> um, we can. Can you contact him? Yeah, we can. They're doing this whole building now, I think. You, we can actually, know. hold on. He's yeah. going to find out. Okay, I'm, I'm muting them again, folks, so that you don't suffer that uh, ghastly noise. So I'm going to just do a recap here for everyone looking in. We started an hour ago, just under an hour ago, doing the soul frequency, um, scalar, double blind placebo, divination readings of um, famous witches and warlocks through history. We've done an hour and we've only covered one, two, three, four, five, five of these characters. Uh, so this is something which, frankly, we could do for multiple, um, multiple shows and we might have to kick into another one shortly. Um, but I think we'll read a few more for the moment. Um, the first one we read was Joan of Arc. The second one, Nostradamus. The third one, Baba, uh, a, a, a Grandma Vanga known as Baba Vanga, and John D. Uh, in England under Elizabeth I's reign. We did him as well. We've just done uh, Alistair Crowley, um, the guy popularly known as the sort of the kind of shock uh, godfather of, uh, of uh, modern uh, witchcraft and sat Satanism and what have you. Um, and we're just moving on to Agnes now, who was the – are you good? Can I open – are we good? do it but we don't know for how long okay, yes that's fine. that's fine so that that siren is going through it fast that's fine uh, we've got a very forgiving audience they've stayed with us so let's crack on. We're, now, we're doing agnes waterhouse the Let first woman to be executed for for witchcraft in england you said that her incarnation signature frequency was 125 again that's no. one two five that is that is her vibrational frequency actually overall, overall 125 125 Got it. Yes. She incarnated at 100. Whoa. Okay. Which is fear, right? Fear. Yeah. And she so, was born. I'm sorry. For people looking in, uh, this yes. is out of a thousand. When we talk about, you know, one, two, five, we're saying out of a thousand. So carry yes. on. Yes. And she was born also at the frequency of fear, 100. Okay. Fascinating. Yes. Uh, her relationship with health was at 100. Yeah. Finances 50, which is the level of apathy, you know, so totally uh, yeah. uh, disconnected. Yeah. Um, creativity 100. Whoa. Relationships 30. Oh, wow. I mean, the, whoa, stop there. Guilt. That, just one moment there. Yes. For anyone looking in, that's 30 out of a thousand. Yes. That is incredibly low reading for somebody. That was relationships. All right, let's move on. Yes, which is guilt at 30. Okay. Uh, personal growth, 20. 20? 20. 20. Sorry, Anthony Fauci is two or three times more involved, interested in personal growth than she was. <laughs> 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 yes, definitely a lot of, a lot of resistance there. Okay. Uh, philanthropy, 25. About you as know? much Gates, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the 20 is shame, right? Uh, the yeah. same as 25 falls into it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The next level is 30, which is guilt. Okay. Uh, intuition, 525. That's love. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, a, she was it's a high number, right? She was definitely intuitive. She was, uh, in this case, with all these numbers, uh, she was in doing, receiving messages, but from 
uh, beings that are in the shadows, right? Lower, lower elemental intelligences. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the joy of how much uh, she was enjoying her divine role, the role that she decided to play, 100%. No way. <laughs> she was definitely fully fully embodied uh, her role. No, but, that, that, but that is like... Uh, uh, um, these other characters that we were discussing, some of these nasty characters, they thoroughly enjoy playing this dark archetype in the soul incarnation, right? They enjoy it. Yes. Yes. And, and uh, this is really the main reason why we decided to uh, incorporate the percentages because we realized uh, through our readings, you know, read thousands of people, and uh, when we came across people that vibrated at extremely low levels of uh, frequencies, that they was they were enjoying their roles fully so it was like okay this is very unique so, so we have got, we've got to do a show on serial killers mass murderers psychopaths yes. we've mm -hmm. got to do it and yes. we just pick the top 12 psychopaths in in the annals of history <laughs> that's, that's great okay so in the now in the now the witch who was burnt the first witch to have been executed uh, in england in the 16th century, uh, how much in the now was she on a scale of one to a thousand? Well, in, uh, in the scale to one to a hundred percent, right? I'm sorry. 100%. Yes. Is one hundred percent. She was in the now one hundred percent of the time. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the ego was one hundred percent as well. And as we know that, you know, the ego is a. Uh, uh, plays an important role, right? Uh, creating or contributing to contrast uh, for the human experience. And but at the level of one hundred, <clears throat> we uh, we really can uh, we turn ego into egoism, you know, because mm -hmm. ego on its own vibrates at the level of four hundred, which is intellect, reason, high intellect. But when a when it's at a hundred percent, more than likely can experience egoism, which drops from four hundred to seventy five from reason to grief, and that's when it becomes toxic, it. right? Got it, okay. Now, self-awareness, she was 100%. No way, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yes. In the, she was, this woman was in the joy 100% as a witch. It is now pretty clear to us mm -hmm. forensic soul, um, uh, 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 forensic experts, it is pretty clear that this woman was a witch. What we would call a witch, and yes. okay, and and her relationships were incredibly low, mm -hmm. which was at the level of guilt of the, thirty. At guilt, at thirty relationships. Yes. Her personal growth was at twenty out of a thousand. Yes. Mm -hmm. Her joy was a hundred percent in the now, a hundred percent, and aware of what she was doing, one hundred percent, in the ego, one hundred percent. Wow. Okay, carry on. Clarity, integrity. Clarity is 100%. Wow. So she wow. was uh, had a clear, you know, uh, vision of of her of her mission and and the path oh, that she was on everything you just no doubt, no room okay. for doubt, yes. Okay. Integrity 100%. What? Yes. This, this is staggering. <laughs> staggering. <I guess. laughs> It, this this tells you that she was uh, loyal and and uh, and faithful to her core values and beliefs, right? So you can have that as well. Someone that is playing in in, in uh, a role in the shadows and the dark, yep. and, and and is in full integrity. You're not okay. going to deviate them from what they believe right. is true to them. Got it. So in the divine, in her divine alignment and personal alignment, what are the numbers? 100 percent oh man are you sure that your technology didn't have a glitch and just got it, <laughs> <laughs> it really hard and shake it? <laughs> you know we've seen this over and over when we've reached shadows that actually this is what happens yes and it gives you a, a contrast to recognize shadows exist and they're also playing their divine role exactly and this those are in the light it's for us to rise to rise in our light Everyone, everyone is playing a divine role yes. in, in this uh, in this reality. So we, we found somebody lower than Hillary Clinton. I don't remember Hillary, Hillary's uh, All the numbers. numbers. 
we'd have to refer back. Yes. But but she this one is a special case. <laughs> Very special. Okay, well let let's let's move on. Yeah. Martha Corey, um, sixteen seventeenth century now. She was sixteen twenty uh, and died in sixteen ninety two. So she lived till seventy two odd years. Was accused and convicted of witchcraft during the Salem, the famous Salem witch trials, um, on sixteen on September the ninth of sixteen ninety two, and she was hanged on September the twenty second. Her second husband. Uh, Giles Corey was also accused. We're talking about a woman called Martha Corey during the Salem witch trials. And we're looking at her soul frequency and the signatures of her life. Uh, in 1677, she had an Ill illegitimate mixed race son. Um, bloom, bloom, bloom. We don't need to go through that. She was known um, for piety and dedication to church attendance. She'd been officially admitted to the Salem vi Village Church in 1691. She had never shown support for the witch trials because she didn't believe in witches or warlocks. She publicly denounced the witch trials as, as well as the judges who were involved in the cases. Probably not a good idea. She was outspoken in her belief that the accusers were lying. And upon hearing this, two young girls, Anne Putnam and Mercy Lewis, promptly accused her of witchcraft. So Martha Corey appears by this backstory to have been a pretty innocent, goodly woman with a bit of a conscience and integrity, ends up being, and speaking against the Inquisition as she saw it, ends up getting accused by two young girls of being a witchcraft. She um, was unaware, Martha, of the level of paranoia in the village. And when she went to trial, she was simply truthful about her innocence. And she never doubted that she would be exonerated because as far as she was concerned, she was absolutely innocent. As the girls testified against her during examination, uh, she asked the judge, um, don't believe the rantings of hysterical children. And she continued to make similar claims throughout the Salem uh, witch trials. So this combination made it very easy for the uh, afflicted girls to create a story accusing uh, poor, poor Martha Corey. Gosh, I'm feeling sorry for her. <laughs> the girls began mimicking her movements as if they were being controlled by her. Um, Mercy Lewis called out, there's a man, he whispered in her ear. And John Haythorne asked Lewis if the man was Satan. Then shortly after, Anne Putnam Jr., the girl cried out that Martha Corey had a yellow bird sucking on her hand, which was enough evidence to persuade the jury of her guilt. Wow, thank God we're no longer in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, her husband defended her against the allegations. Because the accusations against her um, began, she was 72 years old at the time. Uh, now, bear this in mind, okay? She was hanged in September 22nd, 1692, 72 years of age. This accusation represented a turning point in the Salem witch trials uh, because Corey was a respected member of the church who had a good economic standing, good social standing. And after this accusation against clearly a good woman, escalated across the social boundaries that thereby over 100 women were eventually accused of witchcraft. So Martha's husband, Giles, defended her against the allegations. And in due time, he was also accused of witchcraft. He refused to undergo a trial and he was executed by pressing, which is a slow crushing death under a pile of stones. Wow, what a beautiful soul. Uh, the main reason usually cited for his refusal to be tried or to say yea or nay was to keep his estate from being confiscated from his heirs. Wow. Again, man of integrity. Mm. When the sheriff asked him how he would plead, he responded only by asking for more weight of the stones that were being put on him. He died in 1692, three days before uh, poor Martha, his wife, was hanged. And since he had not been convicted, the estate passed in accordance to his last will and testament to those of his children who had maintained that he was innocent. Wow, this is a terrible story. Very saddened already. Martha Corey, 1619, hanged in 1692 as a witch in the Salem Witch Trials. Tell us about Martha Corey's true soul signature. Yes. And, you know, it's interesting because when we tend to read these people, mm. uh, energy comes through. And we, I will share this, of course. But this was actually heartbreaking to read her frequencies because it confirmed everything. And in a way, today, I feel that we're clearing her name 
which needed to happen historically as well. So her frequency overall was 650, uh, which is a frequency of peace. She was incarnated and born at the frequency of 600, peace. Health, she viewed through the lens of 750, which had this enlightened relationship. Finances were 250, neutrality. Creativity for Martha was at 600. Relationships were at 600, peace frequency. Personal growth was 950. So she was fully committed to her personal growth. She was in an enlightened relationship in that area of her life. Philanthropy was 750, which is enlightenment. Sorry, can you go back? What was her personal growth? 950. Wow. And philanthropy, 750. So she was absolutely here to serve from the divine place. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Intuition was 850. So she was highly intuitive. Uh, there was almost no resistance in the divine information that was flowing through her. She enjoyed her life of being her divine self 96% of the time. 98% of the time, percent she was in the now. Her ego only played 34% um, role in her life. So she was very much not in her ego. She was in her heart. Mm -hmm. She was 100% in her integrity, 100% in her self-awareness, 100% in her clarity, and she was 100% aligned with her divine and personal purpose. Like I'm saying this and I'm choking up because- wow. No, I get it. I get it. Man. This, is, yeah. this is really something else. Um, can you just go back to her integrity was 100%? 100%. Yeah. She was okay. honest and she, yeah, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. The opposite of was she was accused for. Yes. You know? So yes. let's just look at this for a moment because I think it's important to try and do some special retroactive evaluations of how is it that, um, that a creepy crawly can come in with diabolical signatures and, and have a successful, joyful life. Um, enjoying being an evil archetype and dying at the age of 93 with lots of money in the bank and lots of affluence and power and and probably get a state funeral at the same time. How can that happen in this yeah. world? And at the same time, you can have someone like Martha Corey, who is just honestly the embodiment of a living saint. I mean, that's, that, that's yeah. all I'm reading here is a true embodiment of a living saint yeah. and just a goodly woman of the soil living in a village and standing up for right for right action and for pure truth at the time of the Salem witch trials, speaking out against it, not as an activist, not banging people's doors down, just speaking the truth to power and to evil at that time. She ends up being accused falsely. She ends up um, being executed and hanged and is in integrity all the way through. Her, her husband, Giles, proves to be the same kind of animal. Wow, it'd be interesting to also do his numbers, wouldn't it, and just see how they correspond. But mm -hmm. I think we get we get the gist of this. Um, so how do we view that kind of incarnation? I've I've always viewed those kinds of incarnations in the same way that I see the incarnation of some of these blessed avatars who are coming in as babes and being ritually sacrificed in pedophile rings and in ritual satanic abuse, black mass rituals. This is happening all around the world. It's coming to an end now the first time in our history but for thousands of years certainly hundreds of years certainly in the last a uh, couple of hundred years 500 years or so it's been endemic endemic blood sacrifice ritual sacrifice and uh, rape and sodomy of, of youngsters because doing so inverts the life force uh, the, the prana and, and and drinking the blood the adrenalized blood after the torture and the trauma is what creates a psychoactive molecule in the blood for the blood drinker the satanist that is a gift, a transfer taking place of the atom seed of light in the molecules of the blood into the belly of darkness. So the blood offering is actually, the light offering is coming in as the incarnation, the soul of that babe who knows at the soul covenant level exactly what they're doing. They are in control of that event. They are the ones that are planting the light seed in the belly of darkness, the heart of darkness, in order to turn uh, those agents of dark slowly back toward light because their blood is poisonous to babylonian priests to satanists but it takes a while for these false uh false uh, parasites to recognize that but there is that beautiful soul exchange the geometry of good and evil being birthed and seeded within each other but within the duality 
a dance of duality. And we have to look at lives like Martha Corey in this context. We must see that. Yes, it's a sad thing. Yes, it's, it's terrible. But what a gift. What a gift to the flame of pure truth as it, as it still is sustained in the, the ethers of this world, courtesy of characters like Martha Corey. Without those characters seeding the flame of pure truth and right action in the ethers with such incredible divine purpose, clarity, integrity, awareness, lack of ego, joy in the now. Wow, what a gift. Thank you. That, that's the, for me, it's a beautiful story. It's a tragic one. It's true pathos. Um, anything else you want to say on, on Martha Corey before we move on? I mean, for us, it was a, we were reading an angel, truly a beautiful light on this earth. And it was so sad. And at the same time, it was an honor for us to clear the history. And there is such a, it's, it's such a gift to read these frequencies because it holds so much information yes. and knowing that we can tap into this information also to retrieve parts that are hidden from us, parts that have been fed into us from external sources and know yes. that frequencies do not lie. That's where the right. truth resides. And that's it. That's the beautiful thing. That is the beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. and, and which is why every, every action counts, every thought counts, every word counts ideation imagination these things leave imprints in the ethers for all times yes okay so let's move to our last warlock um vatumazulu krida mutwa uh, krida mutwa was really brought into prominence uh through the agency of of um uh, my beloved david ike um who met with him. In fact, uh, my adoptive grandmother, who was <coughs> staying with me again uh, this weekend, has, pe has picked up as a bit of a, um, a bit of a hot um, fan following on Instagram now, because I've been putting pictures of her and me and basking in the sun in Bali. But she, she knew Krido Mutwa, my adoptive grandmother, and well, very well, and spent a lot of time with him. So um, she's had, uh, we've had some good words on that. I never met him. Um, my dear friend, Michael Tellinger spent, a lot of time with him and credo very unkindly turned against michael um a few years ago but shortly before credo died um a bunch of uh, maverick asshole activists got to credo mutu and convinced him they're him that michael tellinger had been exploiting uh the science the, the the traditions of the zulus in his publishings and had been mm -hmm. making sums of money none of which was true and credo very stupidly in my view and unwisely uh, went on YouTube and castigating Michael Tellinger uh, in the public domain, which I thought was a shocking uh, thing. Um, I always believe Creed was a good man. This is just my perspective. But uh, he was got to in the last years of his life. Um, and he did some things which were not enlightened actions. They were not uh, kind or gracious. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm interested, very interested, as many will be. This is the last reading we're doing today. So stay with this, uh, guys. We've got uh, 1,040 uh, people um, watching watching us here. So Credo Mutwa, the great Sangoma of the Zulu nation. Now, part of the backstory of Credo that I've also lectured on in, in some of the stuff I, I do when I go on the talking circuit, speak about some of his backstory. This is the Zulu Sangoma, which is a kind of witch or warlock, um, shaman, uh, a shaman, a shaman, mm -hmm. who claims that he was abducted in the Matopus Hills, which is where I grew up in Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. And that is a weird place. Trust me, it is a weird, beautiful, prehistoric, otherworldly alien place with these huge round boulders the size of, you know, houses and buildings that are perfectly round and just on, on this huge rocky, rocky mountainscape. Something very otherworldly in, in terms of the terraforming has gone on to create the Matopus Hills. Beautiful space. Credo Mutwa claimed that when he was a young man, he was walking as a Zulu in the bush through the felt, and he got abducted underground into a alien military base. This must have been, uh, I can't remember, must have been in the 50s, one imagines 50s or early 60s. He was a youth. He was pulled into the underground military bases where surgical procedures were, were done on him, and, what, and he had an extraordinary uh, series of uh, experiences. He ended up seeking counsel on how to uh, deal with the shocking 
um, uh, experience mm -hmm. of interacting with these aliens, but not just aliens, also humans and human hybrids. He ended up having to do a special shamanic ritual, which was to be, I believe it was three days. Uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I believe that for about three days, he had to go into some sort of underground catacomb cave type situation. There were two other adepts that were also put into that initiation, uh, one or two of them into this. I believe that the other two died. Certainly one of them did during this initiation ritual. My What I remember from many years ago was that when he went into this uh, and locked away from the light into this cave uh, situation, he had to take a bite out of the piece of flesh of an alien gray. And it's a bit of a dismembered body of an alien ET that they've got the Zulu people. They've kept on to it. I don't know how old it is, but they required the adepts to do the initiation to become a Sangoma. You are required to take a bite of this and chew it and swallow it. So Credo claimed that when he did this, he said it tasted disgusting. It tasted, he, he described it as being like sucking an old dirty copper coin. And that's what the taste was. That kind of acrid, um, we all know what that, when you lick a copper, that weird uh, taste and sensation. He said that's what it tasted like, a metalloidal substance, very disgusting. He swallowed it. Well, it was like taking a 5,000 acid tabs with ayahuasca, with iboga, with peyote, all at the same time, because he went into a three-day meltdown, um, astral, psychic death, and then a rebirth. Mm -hmm. And as I said, as I seem to recall, one or two of the counterpart, his, his, the guys there died, he surfaced and was made a sangoma on the back of having survived that initiation ritual. So he had this capacity now to be able to withstand uh, the very worst of the assaults that may come against him in the astral, in the psychic, in the demonic, and in the lower elemental realms. So that's part of that initiation ritual. Important backstory, because he then went on uh, to really tell the story of the Chitauri, the Chitauri being the shape-shifting reptiles, the reptilians, these imperial Draco reptilians, that the Zulus nation of Africa have spoken about for, and known about for thousands of years. It's in their story. Hmm. It's in their mythology. The difference is they acknowledge the fact that these exist in the here and now and that there is an engagement and a connection between the Chitauri and the humans. We're connected to their, uh, their genetic um, uh, disposition, having been partly, if not largely, um, genetically modified by and through them. So that's the backstory to Credo Mutua. Very interesting guy. They've tried to pop this guy and kill him many times. He's got had supernatural powers. He only died about a year or so ago. Um, very old, known as a very wise man, uh, but very interested to hear. Um, he also was the, the author of books that draw upon African mythology and traditional Zulu folklore. So that was really his, he was famous for Indaba, my children, which is sit upon the, the grass under a tree and tell stories. I refer to this constantly as being the, the best way of, uh, of, of de-educating our kids, to never let them sit in classrooms behind little wooden desks under flickering mercury light bulbs ever again. We should eviscerate that foul satanic practice. And we should only bring children into this world where we lend ear and we hear their stories. We let them mm -hmm. relate to us and tell us what they remember. They are that much closer to the alpha and the omega than we are. Yes. So we need to actually simply receive these blessed souls. They will speak multiple languages if we let them. They will ev evolve and emerge as long as we stop foot binding them and mind fucking them and trying to control every, uh, every aspect of time and motion. So parents looking in, there's big stories behind this, what I'm talking about, but I hope it resonates. Um, so the Indaba, my children, which is the whole tradition of how the Zulu nation receive children and listen to them and allow them just to sit and tell stories. That's how they learn. Then they go for walks in the bush and they learn about the herbs and the bark and the leaves and, you know, the tributaries and the streams and how to catch monkeys and put salt in a tree in a hollowed out piece so that the monkey puts his hand in to grab the salt and won't let go of the salt. So the monkey's locked there and you can come along the next day and the monkey still won't let go of the salt. And you can then 
undo the monkey from the tree, follow the monkey to a water hole. He'll lead you to water. This is in Dharma, my children. This is storytelling. This is at its finest. So we thank uh, Credo Mutua for this great tradition as a true Sangoma. Um, but please tell us about the soul frequency of the great uh, Credo Mutua. Yes, Credo Mutua's <clears throat> vibration of frequency is 525, which is the love frequency. He incarnated at 500 as well, the love frequency, and he was born at 500 as well. So he was not affected by outside circumstances or impacted. Uh, when it comes to health, he viewed health through the lens of uh, love, actually, 525. Finances, also 525. Okay, yeah. Yes, creativity, 750. Wow. Mm. Yeah, it's very high in enlightenment. I'll, I'll say one moment. Does that mean that he may have been prone to a wild imagination, or does it mean that he was just generally creative in his yeah. approach? Well, I, as you mentioned earlier, that he was uh, a storyteller, right? So I'm, I'm thinking that that's how he really utilized uh, his uh, creativity. And, you know, creativity. He was channeling, you know. Yeah. Uh, the right message and how to relay the message that was coming through him. Yes. But creativity, I always say, is imagination in action. So that's Beautiful. one way of connecting to that. So Love it. Love imagination it. definitely yes. played out in his life. Yeah. Relationships, okay. relationships was 525. Yeah. So he was someone established uh, relationships with an open heart, right? That was that's a low frequency. Personal growth, 700. So he was very committed to personal growth, kind of like yeah. a, an enlightened uh, relationship. Yeah. With birth, personal growth. Philanthropy, 400. That's the level of reason, high intellect, right? Intuition, 600. That's yeah. the level of peace. He was, uh, you know, very intuitive. For sure, and that paired with his level of 750, uh, uh, when it came to in creativity, uh, you know, I'm sure he was definitely uh, uh, able to to uh, express the messages that he was channeling in a beautiful way, right? To relate, especially to children, like you mentioned. Yes. With children. Yeah. In uh, the joy, he enjoyed uh, his divine role 93 percent of the time. <laughs> Wonderful. <clears throat> Wonderful. <laughs> Beautiful. He was in the present moment or in the now, 97% of the time. Great. In the ego was 47%. Wow. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a lot lower than I would I expected from, mm -hmm. from uh, uh, certain anecdotes, but that's great to hear. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And that paired with his uh, vibrational frequency of low frequency, that really gives you a better idea of where he stands, along with his personal growth at 700, um, you know, gives you a good idea where, yeah. of his state of being. No? Yeah. Ego, uh, we said 47, integrity, 98%. Wow, again, that's the same as Nostradamus. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. Right. Self-awareness, 100%. Very good. Clarity, 100% as well. Very good. And his alignment with divine and personal purpose was at 100%. Amazing. So fully aligned with divine and personal purpose. He played his role in this lifetime really mm -hmm. well. Yes. And as we say, based on, uh, you know, the people are playing a divine role. Everyone is rather than the shadows or in the, in the light, we are all experiencing just different frequencies, right? Beautiful. And, uh, when someone is fully aligned with their divine and personal purpose, I think that is, uh, that, that is the ultimate overall. Rather, you have a low or high uh, vibration of frequency. It right. Yeah? right, right, right. Well, let's, let's look now. Um, I hope I don't cough this <clears> up <throat> badly. Just going back and looking at all of our friends, Again, to those looking in, um, 1,100 people thereabouts. Joan of Arc, Nostradamus, Vanga, John D, 
Crowley, Agnes the Witch, who was the Wicked Witch, Martha, who was accused of being a witch but wasn't, and Credo Mutwa, um, the great Sangoma of the Zulu people. So let's just look at the incarnation, um, the, the incarnation signatures. The lowest of that lot was 100, which was Agnes, the, the Black Witch. The highest of that lot was uh, 600, 600, and 600 to Martha, Vanga, and Nostradamus. That was the incarnation signature. They, they were born, the lowest born signature out of all of our um, subjects was 125 on a scale of uh, 1 to 1,000. That was Agnes the Black Witch. The highest um, born signature, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting this mixed up. Born signature was Joan of Arc at 100, Crowley at 100, Agnes at 100. Those were the lowest uh, marks. And the hundred again out of a, one to a thousand, and the to be born at that signature means courage, fear. And fear. Yeah, level of fear. Yes. Okay. So Joan of Arc was born in fear. So was Alistair Crowley. So was Agnes, the Black Witch. That's curious. And the highest um, born signature was Vanga, um, the the Oracle of Bulgaria, at six hundred, and Martha, the Living Saint, who was burnt at the Salem Witch Trials, who was also a 600 signature born. Amazing. Now let's go to the signature of um, their, 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 their standard signature, their frequency, their generic frequency. Mm -hmm. Joan of Arc was 400, Nostradamus 600, Vanga 600, John D 500, Crowley 250, Agnes the Black Witch 125, Martha the living saint burnt as a witch, 650 in enlightened, uh, getting there, right? Mm -hmm. And Credo Mutwa, 525 frequency of love. Yes. Health, the lowest health attributed to any of those archetypes was Alistair Crowley, 75. The highest health uh, was a 750 attributed to Martha, the living saint. Move on to creativity signature. The lowest re re reading we've done today was 100 out of a scale of 1 to 1,000. That was Agnes, the Black Witch. And the highest creativity signature that we've heard today um, is actually two at 850. That was Nostradamus and Vanga, the Oracle of Bulgaria. Moving on to money frequency signature of these archetypes, the lowest reading I got was 50. Uh, Agnes, the Black Witch, 50. Yeah. Meaning to say, how do you read 50 as a signature on 1 to 1,000 for money? It's really apathy. There's uh, disconnected emotionally with it and, and used it, I would say more than likely, based on the other numbers on her chart, used it for manipulation. To manipulate, right. yes. The highest was a reading of 600, I think, which was Vanga. And so in, in, in finance or money, to get a 600 reading means that you are at peace. Yes, there's hardly any resistance in that aspect of, of, of uh, one's life, right? Okay. okay. Very little resistance, yes. Okay. So then let's go to just do the go to, I want to jump forward um, to intuition. The, the lowest mark of intuition out of any of these characters, I believe, was, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, seven, the lowest one was reading was 250. Is that correct? And that was, I think it was um, Alistair Crowley. Uh, he was 300, which is still the same frequency of apathy, but 300, yes, he had the lowest intuition out of everyone in today's group. And the highest intuition that we've read today is seven hundred is eight hundred and fifty, which nine, was the living state. Nine fifty, nine fifty for Michel. Nostradamus. Nostradamus had the highest nine hundred fifty. But that, hang on, that was personal growth. No intuition, intuition for Nostradamus. Okay, I got that wrong. Thank you for correcting. Sure, you're welcome. Correct. Okay, now enjoy to speak about joy. 
the mm -hmm. lowest reading we got in joy was not was 62 percent and that reading was taken from alistair crowley correct yes yes, yes. the highest reading out of these archetypes that we got in joy being in the joy as a soul frequency was 100 percent and that's attributed to agnes the black witch <laughs> <laughs> fascinating this so she was a hundred percent in the joy of all the dark witchery that she was doing amazing yes yes just like the movies right the witch movies like <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, and a really good reason why the young girl might want to be witches, you know. Oh my god, it's freaky. <laughs> All right, in the now, in the now, the signature of in the now, the highest mm -hmm. reading we got today was 100. Again, that's attributed to Agnes, the evil witch. Yes. <clears throat> the lowest reading of in the now we got today was 67% <clears throat> attributed to Alex Alistair Crowley. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he wasn't in the now. He was he was drifting. He was somewhere else. Mm -hmm. well, you know what it was? Wasn't he the one that was also doing uh, the drugs, the mind so altering psychedelics? Yes, yes. yes, famously. Yeah, that's why. Be that, more more out of his body than in his body. You know, it's hardly to remain in the present moment when that that happens. Okay, ego, mm -hmm. ego frequency of these people today. The lowest ego reading we got was 34% from our beloved Martha from the Salem witch trials, the living saint who was burned or was hanged as a witch. Yeah. So Martha was the lowest ego. Uh, the highest ego uh, at 100% was Agnes, the evil witch. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, integrity, the highest integrity mark was 100% for Joan of Arc. For integrity, Agnes and Martha, is that correct? And Baba Vanga. Vanga. Oh, Vanga. For, for, forgive me. Vanga was 100% integrity. So yeah. was Joan of Arc. So was Martha the Living Saint. So was Agnes the Evil Witch. How can an evil witch have 100% integrity? She yeah. was committed to her darkness fully. Yes. She was not going to deviate from her shadow. In any well, you, form, you're just gonna crush, you know, Debbie is my my beloved uh, right hand. Who <laughs> you gave a reading of 100% integrity. She's been strutting around for the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> integrity, and I, yeah, right. Okay, thank you. I'm Debbie's gonna the light. Debbie is well, in the light. Yes, you have to look at the rest of it. Uh, the rest. No, of no, 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 no. I'll just take that bit. That's fine. <laughs> 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 let's, let's look at that was integrity. Let's look at awareness again. The lowest awareness uh, we got today was 92%, and that was from Alistair Crowley. And the highest in awareness we got was 100% from Nostradamus, 100% uh, from Credo Mutua, 100% from Martha the Living Saint, and again, 100% from Agnes the Evil Witch. And Baba Hunger. Hunger. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I keep doing it. And Baba Vanga. So yeah. a lot of clarity, a lot of awareness, a lot of, okay, amazing. Um, clarity, Joan of Arc, 100%, Nostradamus, 100%, Vanga, 100%, John D, 100%, Agnes, the evil witch, 100% clarity, Martha, the living saint, who was hanged at the Salem witch trials, 100%. Um, clarity, she knew who she was and what she was doing. Credo Mutwa, the great Sangoma of the Zulu, 100% clarity. And then lastly, the signatures of the divine and personal alignment. So really the, 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 the raison d'etre, the, the reason for being um, as an incarnation, as a soul. Mm -hmm. And what, what you've read is Joan of Arc, 100%. Aligned, personal and divine alignment. Nostradamus, 100% aligned. Baba Vanga, 100% aligned. John D. under Elizabeth I, her astrologer and occultist, 100% aligned to his divine purpose. Alistair, um, Alistair Crowley drops the scale to 91% aligned with his divine higher purpose. 
Agnes was a hundred Agnes the evil witch was a hundred percent aligned to her divine purpose again this is where the I've just lost my ah we jump back on again and the very last one credo mutwa the sangoma 100 guys that has been absolutely fascinating and um super stoked that we had uh well over a thousand people who are still sitting in with us um how do people get hold of you what is it that you do uh to um clients or customers and how can you be of service and assist to people in their lives doing what you do give give a little bit of spiel on there please Yes, I mean, there's several things that we do, but the main thing that's related to what we're sharing here today, of course, is doing these personal readings. We've been reading also for corporations, uh, making decisions, helping make clear decisions on who to hire. Uh, are you guys in alignment with the person you're seeking or the companies that you want to create an alignment with? Of course, per for personal reasons, we do readings. Mm -hmm. And truly, our intention is to awaken the beautiful essence and help you reconnect to your core, true self that you are here, meant to be here for. Beautiful. And what is the URL that people can can catch oh, you at? Holistic.com. Very good. H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C. Yes. Now, we, we planned um, a couple more shows, a few more shows. I, I think they're going to be ongoing, honestly, because I'm not letting you guys go. I'm so, <laughs> excited. I'm so excited for very, very selfish reasons. Mm -hmm. I want to learn more about datelines i want to be able to tri triangulate um situations relationships uh, i don't personally want to be peering into people unless they kind of want to go along with it i think historical figures is great and i think in certain circumstances to get readings excuse me again readings on on people that you're about to engage with in serious business that can affect people like the work we're doing in our organization mm -hmm. in new Earth university taking people onboarding them to head up a faculty for instance or you know with the international tribunal for natural justice appointing judges and law commissioners you know onboarding people into important roles that are going to have um consequence and have impact and influence uh, on the lives of others i think it's entirely appropriate that as trustees and custodians of the international tribunal of new earth that we can um, reach out and make use of this kind of triangulation tech. It just really helps to clarify things. And mm -hmm. I've, I've learned enough from you both over the last few weeks to know that the, the integrity of what you do, the clarity with which you do it, and, and also the love that you anchor in, in, in what it is that you're bringing to the world is such a, such a gift and such a blessing. Uh, we're going to be doing our next show in about uh, within within a fortnight i don't, don't know if we've set the date yet we will shortly and we'll promote the hell out of it um what are we going to be doing next we've discussed some notes together um should we just give a hint of what we're, we're doing next go ahead feel free <laughs> you because i have no memory i've forgotten what our discussion was <laughs> and we, well, we, jot, we jotted down a few a we did way. we did uh, there's so many things we can dive into one of the things we talked about of course is the faces behind or the people behind famous religious institutions. I think this might be very interesting. And we mentioned that may, perhaps we'll do somebody like Helena Blavatsky, who is behind the Theosophical Society and the New Age Movement. And she's been uh, yeah. a person of interest that actually quite a lot of people had reached out and asked us to do readings for. Yeah. So perhaps we can touch on that right. in our next step. So, so you're saying that, that the founding um fathers founding mothers fathers personalities behind um uh lutherism um seventh day adventism mormonism um scientology right yes yes a um, yes. uh, Jes jesuiticism that's gonna be my favorite <laughs> ignatius loyola i want to know about that son of a bitch i want to learn everything about <laughs> ignatius loyola i'm fascinated um, you know, we could also just do popes through the ages at some point, couldn't we? Yes, definitely. Okay, so religious, religious leaders. Um, we were going to do saints and sinners, weren't we? As well, that's one of the shows coming up. Um, okay, I'm going to put it out to people looking in. We've still got about a thousand people looking in. 
What do you want to see next within the next fortnight? Do you want to see saints and sinners? There's going to be people like Hugh Hefner, the founder of Playboy, you know, as a, as a classic fun sinner. Johnny Depp maybe will bring. No, that that's a bit that's a bit narky. What what character saints and sinners? Mother Teresa, um, you, you've done her, but we can bring saints and sinners in uh, together to one show. Do you want to hear that, or do you want to hear about the frequencies of the founders of our um, big kind of religious and spirituality movements. Okay, I'm reading. I'm going to give you 30 seconds on this, people, and the yeas or the nays are going to get the vote. So I'm seeing saints and sinners. I'm seeing Krishnamurti. How about past presidents? Yeah, we'll get to that. Let's get the sinners first. We want to know about the dark stuff. Okay, I'm <laughs> seeing Charles. He's going to come into the He's going to come in, saints and sinners, more. Founders of religion, saints and sinners, religious. Guys, I'm getting dizzy. Religious, spiritual, <laughs> saints and sinners. Okay, you know what? We're going to have to count. Sovereign and I are going to divvy up, okay? Whoever gets the vote, we'll make the announcement in a week from now, okay? Sorry. So you, you can keep throwing. <laughs> now everyone's getting frantic. <laughs> okay. Jesus, look at this going out of control now. I can't even follow this thread. It's going too quickly. But we will be fair <laughs> in our ballot system here at New Earth Haven, unlike the morons driving your ballot system and the rigging that's going on with the Democrats in the United States. <laughs> had to get that in. Steiner. Well, you know what I have people requesting, actually, systems. is systems testing different healing modalities that exist Different healing devices, healing modalities like Reiki, everything that exists. We yeah, can also yes. do that. That will be a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. Do we retroactively get access to this these threads? We do. So what we'll do is the duty of care here is Debbie and Sovereign and I will go through all of these uh, notes, and we're literally receiving thousands. Um, and in the next week, we'll go through it, and we will divvy up and see what the most popular show is that folks want. I think it's only fair that we, we go along with the populism here. And we'll announce that and uh, see you guys um, within 14 days, I think. Have we set the date yet? I don't think so. Or, or we... No, but 14 days is good. Okay, so I'll tell you what it's going to be, guys. So just so you could put it in your schedules, it's exactly 14 days from now. So it's Friday, not next week, but the week after. It's now um, nearly midnight in Bali on Friday. And you guys, it's what time in the morning? Almost 11 o'clock in the right, morning. Right here. now it's 11. Great. So, but, and you, you're situated in Florida, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> Beautiful. So 14 days from now, we'll be doing the next show. We'll divvy up the votes and we'll uh, start, the, uh, start the marketing and promotions of that a week from now. Um, Elena, Alejandro, guys, such a pleasure. Really looking forward to growing mm -hmm. this beautiful, beautiful movement here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> thanks to Sovereign and to Debbie in the, in the back room here. All right, yeah. guys. Thank you. Oh, nice. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Much oh. appreciated. Syndicate this. Share this. Get this out. This is the technology that we can really begin to start to roll out. Um, Alejandro and Elena are under tremendous pressure from the New Earth University and people <laughs> them, like me to begin to really look to how it's going to be feasible for them to um, do this knowledge transfer, this technology transfer. And we're looking into that with them now, how they can syndicate the knowledge base and the technology, and we can really grow this out. 2021 will be a big year for a massive growth of this. So we could all start to benefit from being able to read the ethers and see through a glass darkly, which is what the Blavatsky's and the Agnes's and the John D's were doing hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Now we're going to use this good technology, which is healthy stuff. It's clean. It's mm -hmm. simply reading the frequencies that exist in the field, in the unified field. This is not subject to interpretation. It's double blind placeboed and where the numbers align, rather like when you're doing a, a DNA um, test, it's only when those, those chromosome maps come together that you know how to interpret and read something. Mm -hmm. So it's accurate stuff. It's beautiful stuff. It's going to help us navigate out of this goddamned, you know, veil of darkness and witchery that we've all been subjected to uh, for 
for centuries, if not thousands of years since uh, the Sumerian and pre-Sumerian times. This is part of our ascension process. There were always going to be technologies that rose up to meet us and came uh, to us at the appointed and the anointed hour. I believe that this is uh, the greatest amongst them. Elena, Alejandro, love you guys and thank you. Thank you.